All right, welcome everyone. My name is Ben Valentino, for those who don't know me. I am a professor and chair of the government department here at Dartmouth uh, College, and I'm also the faculty director of the War and Peace Studies Fellows Program uh, here at the Dickey Center. And so I want to thank you all for uh, joining us today. You all know uh, it's Veterans Day uh, tomorrow. And uh, Veterans Day means uh, a little bit more to us, I think, this time around uh, than usual at, at Dartmouth, in part because of the passing of uh, President Jim Wright, um, uh, who was a Marine Corps uh, veteran um, just a few uh, weeks ago. And so I think uh, his passing has gotten us all thinking a little bit more about what it means um, to serve and um, how to honor veterans on a, a day like uh, tomorrow. So I, I think this opportunity for us is a a good opportunity uh, to return to these kind of classic topics in American life um, involving uh, national service, um, including military service. And um, anybody who's thought about that at all recognizes how much that concept has changed um, over the years and how much our understanding of what our obligations uh, to serve are have uh, changed. I'm also hoping, though, and uh, I know uh, our guests are going to help us with this, that we'll have a chance to reflect on a, another concept, uh, the concept of leadership, which a lot of people think of as uh, held in opposition. It's like the antonym uh, to service, right? Some serve and, and some lead. Um, but I think, that, and this is especially true in our military organizations, that's not the way um, it works. Um, we have a simultaneous service uh, and that service requires uh, leadership of all of uh, the people who serve. But understanding that, uh, how those two concepts uh, interact, I think is going to be a big part of the uh, conversation um, today. So uh, hopefully we'll spend some time uh, on that. Um, we're lucky to have uh, three distinguished uh, guests with us uh, today, each of which has had a personal uh, experience with military service. Um, and each of which I know has thought deeply about um, the place of America's military in today's society, as well as the concept uh, of leadership. So let me not waste any more time and just introduce them, um, and then we can get on with the um, conversation. So the first person um, I would like to introduce is uh, Mark Anarumo, uh, Dr. Mark Anarumo, President Mark Anarumo. <laughs> Uh, Major General Mark Anarumo, he has a lot of uh, titles that we could put before uh, his name. We'll call him President Anarumo um, today. Um, he's the 24th president of Norwich um, University. Some of you might know because the histories of Norwich um, and Dartmouth are intertwined. Norwich uh, University is no longer in Norwich across uh, the river, but it used to be. And that's where um, the name of the institution uh, comes from. It's actually the oldest of America's six senior military colleges. Uh, and it's recognized generally as the birthplace of ROTC. So it's got a long and storied history. Some of that history involves, I think, basically being uh, uh, Dartmouth's first real um, you know, uh, uh, college competitor. Uh, and so there were a lot of hijinks and shenanigans going back and forth across uh, the river. Uh, in the early days of both uh, institutions. Um, so uh, there were friendly feuds uh, that happened, uh, and I guess uh, for many years it was a, a game uh, for Dartmouth students to conduct raids on Norwich and try to steal the brass buttons um, from the uh, uniforms of the cadets. And meanwhile, the cadets would sneak across the river and smash the silk hats and steal the walking sticks of uh, Dartmouth uh, students. That was the, uh, the kind of Dartmouth uniform. Um, so we have a, a, a history of rivalry, friendly rivalry, uh, but I think now uh, I hope we could just have a history of uh, a friendship and uh, increased uh, communications. Dr. Ann Rumo uh, has had a, a, a long and distinguished career um, in the military before arriving at Norwich. He was the director uh, and a permanent professor uh, for the Center of Character and Leadership uh, Development at the U.S. Air Force Academy uh, out in Colorado. And in that capacity, he oversaw um, leadership and education, uh, character education, um, to the more than 4,000 um, officer candidates uh, at the uh, academy during his time 
uh, and he advised honor education programs uh, and uh, the revision of the cadet uh, honor code there. Before that, uh, when he was a colonel, um, uh, President Adarumbo was vice commander of the 39th uh, Air Base Wing at Insular um, in uh, Turkey, the, the biggest uh, NATO base uh, there in that part of the, uh, the world, where he was responsible for overseeing uh, approximately 5,000 uh, U.S. military, civilian, uh, and contractor personnel uh, who were there um, in and around um, the base. Uh, and uh, with the Air Force units especially um, that operated out of there. And then in his career before that, and I could uh, spend the entire time we have running down uh, through his deployments and, uh, and missions, uh, but he served in Iraq and Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Kyrgyzstan, Korea, uh, and that's just uh, part of the alphabet, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think of a uh, special note, though, uh, given this discussion, uh, it's worth mentioning that President Adarumo uh, got into the military as an enlisted person, uh, joined in 1987, um, and started out enlisted, uh, but went back after uh, on the GI Bill to complete his uh, bachelor's degree, and then um, uh, spent 27, no, 26 years as an Air Force officer. And along the way, somehow, don't ask me how this is possible, picked up both a master's degree uh, and a PhD. Um, both from uh, Rutgers University, and then uh, completed a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at Harvard University. We won't uh, hold that against you uh, here at Dartmouth. I'm, I'm sure those other degrees more than make up for the Harvard degree. Um, no, but uh, uh, a really, obviously, impressive um, career, both in academia and in the military, so quite appropriate uh, that he would be here to speak with us uh, today uh, on these issues. So thank you so much uh, for taking time to, to join us. Then uh, these two gentlemen uh, further to my left um, are Ryan Irving. Uh, he's a member of the class of 2024 here uh, at Dartmouth. And Ryan is a Marine Corps uh, veteran. He's also president of the Student Veterans uh, Association here at Dartmouth. Ryan deployed to Afghanistan, um, uh, eventually as a sergeant, where he served as a rocket ammunition chief and a HIMARS gunner. Um, uh, normally, I would have to uh, tell everyone what the heck HIMARS <laughs> is, but it so happens uh, that uh, that particular weapon system has gotten uh, a lot of press lately um, in Ukraine, uh, where the United States has sent large numbers of them. And so uh, I think you could probably ask uh, Ryan what he thinks about how HIMARS is doing in, in that part of the world. Uh, I'll also say, though, that uh, Ryan is uh, a kind of budding uh, military historian. You know, I don't think he's a history major, right? Um, but he created what I think is just a really excellent uh, exhibit at Rauner Library. I encourage you all uh, to go and see it called The Fighting Tradition, Dartmouth uh, in the American Wars. There are some really um, uh, interesting artifacts out there that uh, Ryan selected and, and curated. That uh, exhibition is open until December 3rd, so you still got some time to go and see it. Uh, War and Peace, our group has already been there to see it, but if you haven't, I really strongly encourage you, it won't take too long, um, and I bet you will uh, like it just as much as, as we did. And then lastly, we've got uh, Leland Hemgren. He's a member of the class of 2025 here at Dartmouth, um, and he's studying international relations and uh, Russian, two uh, things that go particularly well together these days. <laughs> He was a U.S. Army Special Operations uh, uh, vet and uh, continues to serve with the Army uh, in the Reserves. Leland has held positions uh, as an enlisted team member and a non-commissioned uh, officer and deployed twice uh, to Afghanistan. At Dartmouth, he's the Vice President of the Student Vets Association and the Vice President uh, of Professional Development for the Pi Lambda Sigma Pre-Professional Society. And most importantly, he's one of our own uh, War and Peace uh, fellows, so we're glad to have him on this side of the podium uh, this afternoon. OK, so that's a lot of introductions, uh, but I think uh, uh, these people are well worthy uh, of a little bit of uh, introduction. So thank you all three uh, for coming. What we're going to do now is have Ryan and Leland and I uh, sit over here and uh, give the floor to Professor uh, 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 President Anarumo. He'll speak for a little while, and then we'll uh, all come back uh, to these chairs and have a bit of an open discussion before opening it up uh, to you all. So thank you very much, and the floor is yours.
thank you very much. And I'm going to stand here because I'm on intermittent fasting. So I've had 12 cups of coffee already today, and I, and I won't eat until dinner. But thank you for that wonderful introduction. And one thing that was not mentioned, which is highly personal, is so my son is 24 years old. He's going to be 25 in about a week and a half. And he's now a pilot in the Air Force. He flies uh, the MQ-9 Reaper, which is a remotely piloted aircraft. He was the goalie on the Air Force Academy Division III team. They have a D1 and a D3 team. And he played 10-year-old, what is it, squirts, I guess it was, at the pro, with the ProTech Ducks with Ryan in New Jersey. <laughs> I mean, how randomly funny is that? So thank you. He had texted me and said that you were, I, and, but what a beautiful world we live in that they can still be in contact after all those years, right? So as a, th thank you for making sure I, I was aware and didn't forget. So everyone, I'm just going to talk, I would say, for 15 or 20 minutes just to respect the clock. So if I'm looking over there, I want to make sure I'm respecting everyone's time. I just want to introduce some high topics, like wave top, 30,000, 50 kind of things, because I think the facilitated discussion and Q&A will be much more valuable uh, for everyone, right? Because I would like to know what you would like to know, and I know we want to hear from these two uh, gentlemen as well. So I'm going to start with saying something that makes people cringe now because of the panic which goes to our theme. I'm going to say Happy Veterans Day to everyone in the room and to everyone in the virtual audience who are veterans. Because we have conflated now Veterans Day and Memorial Day. Memorial Day is the holiday where we commemorate and mourn our war dead, and in some cases, those of our international partners. But Veterans Day is a day to celebrate our veteran community. And there's a lot to celebrate. And I'm, I'm extraordinarily proud. My entire adult life, I was either enlisted in the Army, I was an officer in the Air Force, I joined as a high school dropout, believe it or not. I was a very troubled young person in, uh, in New Jersey. And back then, that was a vehicle. The Army straightened me out. I got the GI Bill, and then it kind of took off. And there, I got the master's PhD and the postdoc as a military fellow, where they funded me to go get my advanced degrees. I was extraordinarily fortunate. So I owe everything in my life to two communities, uh, the military and higher education. And now I've landed at the ultimate job for somebody that has more gratitude than anyone on the planet for those two industries as a president of Norwich University, which is the nation's oldest private military college. And we're very, very proud of our uh, long history. So I'm speaking to you all from a position of extreme gratitude. But I really want to share some of the things that are happening because the, the theme that we discussed over the course of several weeks leading up to today was about character and leadership and kind of the state of things in our society, especially as, re, as it relates to uh, the military. And I've been in a lot of national level conferences and interactions lately, and I'm hearing the same thing from every presenter, and it's about uh, our military is having a very difficult time attracting and retaining talent right now. And they're blaming it on, the articulation is, this generation has got the lowest propensity for service of any generation in our history, of our country. And I listened to it. I mean, the Army just missed their recruiting goals by 25%. 25%. That's how few enlisted folks are entering. And it's a, it's a very profound pyramid in the military. You need the first termers, we call them. It's a young person's game. I was talking to a gentleman over here about Weber River Junction. According to VA, I'm 240% disabled. VA math. It's a, it's, different, it's a different kind of math, right? That, the entire image of the military right now is very difficult for the generation coming in to really comprehend. It's a young person's game. We need the young people to understand and appreciate it. And what we need, the same generation we need to come in right now, is the same generation that is college age. 17 to 22, call it, right? And call it Gen Z, everyone hates the labels, but there's certain qualities of generations that are very clear. I'm Gen X, we're like a forgotten generation. We're Gen X, right? I mean, everyone forgets about us, because it goes baby boomers, millennials, Gen Z. We can talk about generations later if you want to do Q&A. But why is there a low propensity for service? And I did, some, I did a lot of research. I actually dug pretty deep into this question. And the answer is, I'm going to say your generation. I don't mean to you know, uh, pigeonhole anyone. There's not a low propensity for service. There's low propensity for military service. And that's an incredible distinction because the propensity for service is actually very high in the current generation. But the military markets who we are, I say we still, but who the military is so terribly right now. Because what is the number one issue to this generation, this age cohort? The number one issue is climate change. And 
it, that bears it out over almost every study. Now, when you hear a four-star general talk about climate change as a national security problem, and they do so to, so clunkily, but it doesn't really resonate because they say it so poorly, it's because they are trying to reach the generation they need to enlist or serve as junior officers. It's because they're trying to connect with the one thing that matters. Because in the military, if you project what it means to serve right now, what do you see mostly? You see PTSD, and isn't the military treating our veterans with PTSD better now? And we are doing better now. We have to do a lot more. And this is deeply personal to me. I'm sorry, I probably should stop doing that. You know, I, I lost people over the course of my career. And I lost exponentially more to suicide than I did to enemy action. And that's a profound um, issue. And that was not present in previous generations. You know, how did the generation that hit the beaches of Normandy have a lower rate of suicide than the current generation, right? Warfare is different. There's a lot of reasons driving this problem, but it's a significant, significant problem. So if you're a young person looking at military service, you can see, well, it's nice they're treating the vets better now, but I don't want a TBI, and I don't want PTSD. So why would I do that? There's also the way we treat our wounded warriors. And this is a place where the military and the VA especially, and I'm just gonna thank you again, by the way, for your service with the VA, because I've had such a wonderful experience. Um, I get all my care from White River Junction. I don't even have health care anymore from uh, my employer. I just go right to White River because they do a wonderful job. We save lives on the battlefield now, but that means you have catastrophic injuries of folks that would have died previously because battlefield trauma, medical care has gotten so much better. So now you have missing limbs, or you have extreme TBIs or other issues. So now we have a lot of wounded warriors and the prosthetics. I got sent back, I got hurt pretty badly. It was internal. And I was feeling bad for myself when I was in uh, the Bethesda Medical Center um, down in DC. And I, held, I kept hearing whirring mechanical noises every time I was in and on an elevator from other people. I looked down, I realized I was in the prosthetic uh, ward. Um, and it had the people that were 19 years old that had now artificial legs. And they were getting robotic legs that had to be charged, but it gave them incredible mobility. And you see how we have to do accessible housing now for catastrophically injured veterans. So they can come in in a wheelchair or a prosthetics and they can operate and live in a home. The towers for, um, Tunnels for Towers. That was one of the great, uh, great charities. So all this looks great, but a young person that could choose to enlist looks at that and says, well, that's great, but I don't want to lose my legs. Right? So even though it's progress, it projects in a terrible, unappealing way. So I do believe the generation that we need to attract in the military can be incentivized to come, but it's a, we're doing it terribly. The military is doing it terribly. Which is an amazing statement, because the military has always had the best recruiting and marketing slogans uh, in, if you're into marketing and brand marketing, it's always been the best, right? Be all that you can be. It was one of the great slogans of all time in marketing history. For me, it was what a great place. It's a great place to start. It's a cool jingle, and I, I can sing every schoolhouse rock song from TV, if you know school. Right? I, I, it's earworms. I'm endlessly infected by earworms. But the jingle and the slogans flooded the military as an all-volunteer force. And by the way, having an all-volunteer force is extremely beneficial. It, it's very unique to the United States, and it's extremely important that we maintain it, I believe. This might come up in the Q&A. We have to incentivize big people in. So how did the organization that had the best brand marketing in the world become one of the worst? And a lot of it's just the stubbornness of my generation to not adapt to the new generation. And I have four kids, 29, 24, 21, 17. And I get to live every day through their lens. And that's where I know why we're missing the mark so bad. So transition really quick to uh, the concept of leadership with the generation. I think this is a core part of the conversation. And this is fascinating for me. Because studying Gen Z, 17 to 22 year olds right now, the desire to be a leader is probably the most powerful internalized desire of the generation. They want to come out and lead because they want to be effective out of the gate, right? Now we, my generation says, well, you gotta make your bones. You gotta follow first. You gotta do your time. But that's not, that doesn't resonate now. So we're actually changing the language of leadership. So the first step is not, we can't say followership. That's very unappealing. I mean, if I looked at you and said, hey, you wanna come in and be a follower for 10 years? <laughs> no, right? I wanna be a CEO and get my own company going. I wanna go do something that, that's meaningful. I wanna be in charge. So we're actually changing. The first step of leadership now is the personal domain. You have to learn how to lead yourself. And that's much more powerful than saying you have to learn followership first. Because 
Believe me, I've come full circle on all this stuff. You know, I understand now very clearly that we all have inherent biases. And you have to learn that about yourself before you can be an effective leader in small teams and in organizations. And here's the model if you want to look it up. It's called PITO, P-I-T-O. There's four stages of leadership. It's personal, interpersonal, team, and organization. You gotta learn how to lead yourself, then you learn how to lead small groups, then you learn how to lead teams, and then you get to organizational or enterprise leadership. But you have to do them sequentially. Very few people can jump without making those and learn their mistakes. And we were talking a little bit before we started about how older people, I never thought I'd be at a stage in life where I could categorize myself as an older person, yet here I am, right? You know, we have to develop a higher level of risk toleration to tease out the innovative nature of this generation. On the battlefield, the, future, the current and future battlefield, those who innovate the most quickly win. And now we're bringing artificial intelligence onto the battlefield and all these incredible new technologies. If we have stoic and rigid application rule sets and we punish innovation on a battlefield, we're going to lose. There's no question. And then you get into the ethical application things. And this is what we're talking about for a second, too, because it's moving into the concept of honor and how this is generationally unique, too. Because older generations, we get into what is your loyalty? What is the structural loyalty that we bring in? And really, we're more of an enterprise loyalty. Right, so at, at Norwich University, for example, if I was a freshman at Norwich, it would have been in the 90s, I would have been loyal to Norwich University and then to my country, right? Now, this generation is much more loyal and passionate about the, the small team and near peer interaction. So your first loyalty, it's flipped. Your first loyalty is your roommate, your best friend, uh, now your teammate. Your, your athletic team, your floor of your dorm, whatever that is, and you don't get to the enterprise level or institutional level until much later. And that is what has broken the honor codes at the service academies. Because a, and this is, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna talk about my son, I asked her for his permission. He went to the Air Force Academy. He's a freshman, and then I got hired to come and run the leadership center where we had the honor code. His first semester, he got caught up in the cheating scale. 76 freshmen got caught cheating. Not in an academic class, it was knowledge. It was a test that's designed for you to not pass. It's like how many ribbits are on a C-130 or something nonsensical. But it was teaching them how to fail and recover from failure. But they all wanted to help each other pass, so they cheated. Now, his last name's Anna Rumo, and he's Mark Jr. Everyone on the planet knew who he was. So I had to recuse myself from this, and he came in the office crying. I was like, listen, dude, I just gave up my operational career to come here and keep the family together. If you get kicked out of here, you know, you're in, a, you're in the doghouse for at least one generation, right? You're getting nothing. <laughs> you're out of the will. He's crying, but I said, you know, I'm out. It's your problem to solve. And he came back strong, and he wound up being the cadet colonel in charge of Larner as a senior. So we had a good recovery process, right? But the military service academies continue to not adapt what they expect honor to mean to this generation, and they keep bringing the old rigid processes there, and that's why the continuous scandals keep happening. We have to adapt. But we have to also teach, okay, if you help this other person cheat so they can pass mechanical engineering 101, right? And they eventually graduate and build a bridge that collapses, you have a role to play in that. So the answer is how do you teach them why you have to maintain a system of honor and integrity and develop them through the thought process to understand it differently than they do innately? So that's been an interesting challenge for the military also, uh, to also work through. I had more to talk about with mental health and more leadership transition things, but I think those are the good, that probably facilitates a good conversation, sir? It does, absolutely. All right, and these two Shall are much we? more in there. And let's notice as they're coming up, we didn't plan this. <laughs> Khaki pants, blue shirts, blue sport coat, all three of them. There's something about that. So you, you guys have to have a uniform, <laughs> even when you're not wearing a uniform. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that's a wonderful way to get us started. And I think uh, uh, hopefully everyone here will see uh, that these problems uh, that President Anarumo just described that exist in the military academies, those aren't unique, uh, obviously, to the academies. Um, you know, civilian uh, educational institutions have had our series of similar scandals. And of course, we have an honor code here at, uh, at Dartmouth. And, uh, that's not uh, adhered to universally either. And so um, uh, we're facing some of the same kinds of questions and how to inspire our students to follow those codes um, 
at the same time as we give them the flexibility to think for themselves. All right, there's much we could discuss, and I want to make sure we quickly get to questions from the audience. But I thought I would start us out by asking all three uh, of our guests a kind of big picture question uh, about service. Uh, and so I was uh, doing a little brushing up on the uh, Norwich University history uh, before this uh, presentation and uh, reading a little bit about the founder of Norwich University, really interesting guy, a Dartmouth uh, alum uh, named Alden Partridge. And Partridge uh, had uh, served in the, the military, but became convinced that the military was not serving American society as well as it should have, although it, he believed it was generating uh, high quality um, officers and soldiers. Um, but what he began to worry is that um, it, uh, the United States was neglecting its militia organization, what you might think of now as the reserves in a way of, of his time, the citizen uh, soldiers as opposed to the professional um, military. And he thought that the United States was moving too much in the direction of the professional military and forgetting about that connection between civilians and the military that the founding fathers uh, of the United States cared so much about. And if you go back and read um, the writings of those early American founders, you'll see a lot of preoccupation with this question of how can a democracy have a, a military organization, a professional military organization, yet remain a democracy? And their answer to that um, was the, the militia, to have an organization in which um, the military was not seen as a separate class permanently apart from the civilian society, but instead integrated um, kind of from top to bottom uh, and in regular communication with civilians. And so uh, even back then, Partridge was worried that we'd started to stray from that, um, uh, from that example. Fast forward, obviously, to today. And um, we can see um, that we're facing this question again, in part because of the all-volunteer um, service. It's no longer a draft. And that means that most Americans today um, don't know anyone, uh, at least not uh, uh, well, don't necessarily have a family member who serves in the military, um, except maybe a grandfather or something like that, don't know someone who's in active um, service. And I think uh, people have rightly uh, begun to worry uh, whether that gap between civilians and our military is growing wider, especially at places like this. And I mean that both in the sense of geography. So New England uh, sends fewer uh, people per capita uh, to our military than I think any of the other regions of the, the country. And then um, at um, uh, highly selective universities like Dartmouth, um, we have fewer uh, people uh, doing ROTC than we might see at um, other universities around the, the country. Uh, and uh, so I think that creates a situation where we have to ask again, you know, have these two parts of our society that um, since the founding of our country, people have worried need to stay connected. Um, have they started to uh, move apart? And if so, what can we do um, to try to reverse that trend, to get uh, more people interested um, and from more different backgrounds in service. Again, whether that's military service or maybe some other kind of national service, that would serve to uh, bring our country together at a time when uh, obviously anyone who's following the news knows we're more divided than ever. Um, so I thought I'd start with you on this and then uh, uh, talk to these gentlemen here. All three of you decided to serve. Um, and so I think you have some good perspective on this. And of course, you've interacted um, outside of those, uh, what you might think of as more stereotypical standard military circles. So you've seen it from both sides, maybe more than uh, most people have. Well, it's interesting because even at Norwich, um, you know, we have two lifestyles. We have a civilian lifestyle with traditional college students, and we have the Corps of Cadets, which is a military lifestyle. But even the military lifestyle Corps of Cadet students, only about 48% of them go into the military. The rest just came for the structure, and the alumni group is very, very strong, and they tend to overrepresent high levels of private industry and non-uniform government service. But I think you hit on, to me, which is the answer, which I tried to um, at least give a highlight of, I think the answer is projecting service and the desire for this generation to serve 
And the uniform service is just one of the vehicles that you can you can achieve a, a service life, right? Or at least do this early enough in life that you can enjoy it and expand your horizons. You know, one of the problems that are being faced right now is even those that want to serve, the medical disqualifications are higher than they've ever been. If you've ever been on ADHD medication or anti-anxiety or antidepressant medication, you have to be off it for a year and get a doctor's note to make sure you can function in the military without those. But I think we're in the 40th percentile now of, of young people under 23 that are diagnosed with anxiety or depression. So you're taking half of the population of the country out right away of the ability to serve medically, eczema, asthma, all of these things are medically disqualifying for military service. So if we put our hand up and say, well, you can't serve, and that's not a good plan. How about we say, you can't be in uniform service. How about non-uniform government service? How about Peace Corps, which Norwich always had a hand in um, populating the leadership elements of the Peace Corps, or other ways that you can serve. I think we show a better menu and say, here's ways that you can serve, and here's uniform, and here's the incredible benefits you get from that, Here's these other options if you can't or don't want to. I think there's a way to, to better project that there's, that there's options beyond uniform service. But, and I love the way you introduced this question, you know, Alvin Partridge founded Norwich. He was a superintendent at West Point. It's the exact opposite problem that we're facing now. Back then, the military was populated only with the children of the elites. So government officials and captains of industry. So the whole military was just the uber wealthy or the uber influential, and they perpetuated that way. He founded Norwich University to make sure there's a representative sample of factory workers, immigrants, and farmers that became the future leaders of our nation's military, which is a pretty beautiful idea. But now, we have low, lower propensity to be in uniform service of the wealthy, and it's those, like when I was a kid, that wound up having to go in because it's a great option. So there's, I think I've answered it in a roundabout way, bigger menu and understanding we need a representative sample of our nation to be in uniform for it to be effective. What about you guys? Um, you we've talked to that. We've talked a lot about um, you know uh, recruiting and how to attract youth to um, you know military service, um, and I think the idea that we're moving towards like a professional military is a scary one. I think civil control of the military is one of the you know values that we hold in the highest regard, probably in this country, and moving away from that is definitely um, not a not a, not in a good direction. Um, and I think that like we as a as a country we need to you know work with veterans more. I deal with a lot of veteran issues here. Um, and I think that some of the treatment of veterans um, is, although we are getting better, as you said, um, might not be uh, improving enough to attract um, you know, younger members of society. Um, one thing that I found very interesting was you know, um, early on in the early 2000s with a lot of the veterans issues, uh, suicide and mental illness was attributed to combat um, stress, which is an obviously very real problem. Um, but as combat has gone down, you know, suicide in the military has continued to gone up, and we're finding out that it's operational stress from, um, you know, not enough mental health resources or um, poor leadership. And I don't know if that's an attractive, you know, prospect to youth who, as we talked about, climate change is their biggest issue, or whatever service they are looking forward to. How does that help them? And then you also mentioned about how um, you know, lower income levels are you know, disproportionately represented in the military. Um, and that's something that I think will probably continue into the future. And the leadership after the military service is um, you know, very important to us at Dartmouth with President Wright. And uh, the you know, Yellow Ribbon Program and the GI Bill, which allows veterans to create generational change. I think focusing on that um, and getting, you know, making sure that veterans are taken care of you know, your education will be taken care of. You'll be supported by your nation afterwards. I think that's kind of how you can kind of solve this, um, you know, problem we're seeing with recruitment numbers or retention numbers. Um, and I think the generational change definitely necessitates a conversation. I know when I was in the Marines, we felt very frustrated with our senior leadership, but, you know, I think that's a very common thing throughout the, the years. Um, but one, one small thing that might not mean a lot to people not in the military was, you know, sleeve tattoos in the Marine Corps. Right, it's such a small thing, and tattoos have become very normalized in society. But to the older generations, you know, sleep tattoos uh, equal you being, uh, you know, a rock star or something, not like professional, you know, appearance. And as 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 like silly as it sounds, stuff like that, where you're taking control away from a generation that has, uh, you know, all these you know resources at their fingertips for the first time, um, leads 
you know, leads to frustration and uh, low retention rates, which I think, you know, when, when a, you know, a highly skilled service member leaves the military for, you know, a silly reason such as tattoos, um, all the knowledge and experience that he has, specifically with, you know, um, you know, recent deployments to the Middle East and some of that combat know-how that you just can't replicate in the schoolhouse, that's going to leave with them. And I think that's something that we need to address, um, specifically with, you know, the Gen Z generation, which I'm um, representative of in the older uh, demographic. Leland? I think one salient point, I don't know how impactful it is to recruitment as a whole, is the changing mission set. Um, the loss of two wars um, affecting who goes into the military. And I don't think the military has done a good job of describing the other missions that it can offer to people who want to serve. They don't portray the hospital uh, specialists working at Walter Reed who are doing prosthetics work. They're not talking about the Coast Guard uh, service members who are patrolling the waters, making sure that people are safe when they're off the coast. Um, I just want to talk about my platoon a little bit. Um, in Ranger Regiment, I was a part of a 20-man organization. Everyone had college degrees. Uh, some had degrees from Johns Hopkins. Um, one man was an, a CEO of, a, of his company before he gave it up to come join Ranger Regiment. And all of them had the common drive of a mission. The special operations mission was that we knew that we were going to deploy and we were going to get in a fight. And I think there is a small population of Americans who are hard chargers and want that experience, that want to fight on the front lines for the nation. And I think the loss of Afghanistan and Iraq, it's fantastic that we're no longer involved in bloody conflicts, but the military hasn't reprioritized its mission set. It's not calling for people to go serve in the medical corps. It's not calling for people to go help patrol the, patrol the shores or work on nuclear reactors or do civil service that is incorporated in the, uh, in the military infrastructure. That's great. Did you, did you want to add? That was beautiful, by the way. Well said. Uh, the way the military is actually starting to change the personnel practices is also indicative of the need to change and be less rigid, and that you both kind of touched on it. it. Used to be you had to, to retire, you needed 20 years. You got 50% of your base pay at 20 years, you got 75 at 30 years, and you got the formula in between. But now it's a 401k program, because we know, and they finally realize the generation coming in isn't going to commit to 20 years. The military, the Air Force has a pilot shortage because you have a 12 year commitment to go to fight school in the Air Force. Now, Gen Z doesn't want to do something for 12 minutes, let alone 12 years, right? <laughs> so they don't have people want to be pilots. They're not going to commit to something for 12 years. So you can't expect this generation to commit for 20. So now you get five years, you're invested, and you can come in and out of service, and you picked up where you left off, which is beautiful. There's on ramps and off ramps. That hopefully will be more appealing and drive a higher propensity to, oh, I can try this. You take a year off to start a family, take care of your elderly parents, get your advanced degree, and they slide right back in, right? That would never have happened even eight years ago, but now it's coming to be more normalized. So what you both just said, um, and I wanted to add that so everyone knows that that might be something that helps break the watch in. Ryan or Leland, did you have any questions for President Anarumo before we open it up uh, to the audience? Anything uh, you wanted to take this opportunity to ask about, respond to his uh, comments and his uh, opening remarks? Just a quick one. Have you seen any demographic shift in the people who want to be cadets at Norwich? I have not, but I've only been there for only my third year now. Right, so we we pretty simple. We have a national sample. We have every state except Wyoming. We have Alaska and Hawaii. Well, we got to get to Wyoming apparently. <laughs> but uh, I tell you, one of the things demographically is worth mentioning. We were the first. So there's five service academies, right? Coast Guard, Merchant Marine, Air Force, Navy, Army, and there's 16 military colleges. Norwich is the first, still the best, right? BMI, Citadel, Texas A&M, Virginia Tech, and University of North Georgia. Those are the 11 schools that are Norwich's attendance. We were the first to admit women, and women still to this day are our highest performing demographic for leadership, academics, and um, service success. What we've done differently than others to have this incredible demographic quality, 
We're actually not sure. We're doing a study to identify. <laughs> We're calling it the secret sauce study. You say, well, what is it about women at Norwich that they just crush it routinely and have for, I mean, really since the 70s? So uh, demographically, we're going to start articulating that more aggressively because we want to continue to be the preferred um, institution for women for that, uh, that want that lifestyle. But I would say not necessarily yet. I will tell you it's hard to get ethnic minorities and underserved communities to consider Vermont, we have found. Um, so they tend to go to Citadel and BMI at higher proportions. We're, but we're targeting those demographics to see if we can be more appealing. You have anything, Matt? Um, one thing that we talked about was um, earlier is like the changing of demographics. And as, in your opinion, like as the technical capabilities of the civilian population grows, um, this is something that was talked about in the Commandant's planning guidance almost every year, um, that you know Marines continuously are becoming more technically proficient, even if they're infantrymen or artillerymen, mm -hmm. not necessarily cyber warfare specialists. Um, do you think, we were talking about this problem with recruiting, and retention, do you think that the military leaning in more into the technical jobs will be able to get to this, you know, more educated demographic that we were talking about um, that is over or underrepresented versus, um, you know, lower income, uh, the, the lower income demographic? Thanks. So I'll, I'll answer that with a very brief story and then I'll fill in the blanks, right? So I'm a captain, I'm at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, and every, I, I drove a minivan for like 25 years, right? So a lot of kids and it was missing a hubcap. I had the side kicked in and it was crazy, right? But it, it was paid for and it was good enough. And every day at the Air Force Base, a Maserati parked next to me, every day. And it made me feel worse because the contrast things are always worse, right? And he comes in one day, it's a two striper. And so a junior, first term enlisted person. I said, hey, what's up with the car, buddy? Right, he's like, oh, sir, you know, I'm a reservist. This, I just do this because I enjoy it. He was a, he was a communications um, individual. Because he had his own business on the side, and he was making more money than I'll probably make in my lifetime. But he liked to serve enough that he did the one week in the month thing, right? And he'd do it, and I'd catch him with his fancy car, and we'd talk. I was like, well, that's interesting, right? And we, I took him out to lunch one day. I'm like, well, tell me, why, why are you serving? This is fascinating to me. We can bring them in. And we can make the mission appealing because we have cool toys. We got cool stuff, right? And you can say, hey, come in with your tech expertise and your tech savvy in WASTA, and let's give you the access to some things you will not get anywhere else. But we're going to pay you one-tenth of what you can make on the outside. <laughs> I mean, how's that value, value proposition, right? I mean, the Army is throwing money for enlistment bonuses at unbelievable levels right now, but it's for everything because twenty-five dollars or $35,000 is not that much in the government budget system, right? And it's enough to entice someone to come in and give it a try. But to leverage tech sector and the emerging technological battlefield is critically important. Right? And that is a way that we can give a hook. But we better be able to pay the differential. And we have to at least be within the 50th percentile and not the 10th percentile. right? And then once they're in, they're going to get the certifications and they're going to go. And all that investment in our training is now done. Like both of you were highly trained. You talk about retention. You can't replace experience. You can regrow it. But what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan could be critically important to the future battlefield, but not if we lose everybody, because they won't stay. So um, I have, I'm hoping to see it. But I was just at a, the Association of the U.S. Army. It was basically an indoor arms bazaar in Washington, D.C. It was very disturbing, right? But I'm watching all of the new weapon systems, and they're all so highly technological. And artificial intelligence is already being deployed on the battlefield. And we better have the right young people to manage it. So it, there's a hook in there, but we're gonna, have a, we're gonna have a pay gap problem very quickly. Well, that's a great way to get us uh, started with a broader uh, conversation. And so I wanna now open it up to the audience and um, especially to our students. We'd love to get uh, questions from you. So we'll, we'll bump you up to the, the front of the list. So just, Raise your hand if you want to be recognized. And before you start asking your question, wait till we get you a microphone uh, so that uh, those listening in uh, on the stream can hear you. So who wants to start us out with the first question? Anyone is uh, welcome to ask. I'm just going to give priority, at least in the beginning, to our, our students. Who wants to show some leadership here? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
All right. So, yeah, I really appreciate you guys uh, coming over here to speak to us today. But um, so my dad actually served in the Navy for 20 years as a, a Navy doctor. And we lived in places like Okinawa, Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad served like the Marine and sailor population there. And I was just wondering, like, do you know how the military maintains its like relationship with the civilian population and overseas bases? Mm -hmm. Cause I know that's like kind of an issue nowadays where like a lot of people are calling for like the military to move its bases like off from overseas and like back to like the United States because of uh, like certain issues that um, the military faces with the civilian population. So uh, yeah, that's, that's just my question, so. Well, thank you, it's a good one. And uh, I, so you lived with your, with your father while he was overseas in the uh, service? Yeah, my family moved to Okinawa for like I think four years. Okay. Two years after that. So. Beautiful. So my children, and I'll, I'll contextualize this with our with our experience. So yeah, I lived overseas most of my adult life because uh, of the military, and uh, we were in Turkey from 2014 to 2016, where I was the deputy commander of this base, and I had certain mission sets, and I'm a single parent, so my kids were with me. And uh, when ISIS started operating in Turkey, my children showed up on a kidnapping and hit list, and they got evacuated in the dead of night to Germany. And then, then I got picked up for another job, and I went to Germany. And by the way, I thought they were living terribly, and I, I felt like a terrible father. They were living like the, the dream. They had a condo and Kaiserslautern in Germany, and they made me feel terrible. I flew up on a C-130 in the back, like shivering. I got out, like I, got, I opened the door. One was in the air dunking a Nerf ball, and the other one had like six friends over. I said, why'd you guys make me feel bad? <laughs> so they told me I couldn't be active duty anymore. I, I transitioned to the Air Force Academy, right? But still, if you ask them what was your favorite experience, they would say Turkey. They would go back to Turkey tomorrow, even though the first year was beautiful, the second year was very tense, and the coup happened, and ISIS started uh, um, conducting assassinations all over the area. And it was because the interactions we had with the local civilian population. Now, that was a very unique spot, because we had a Kurdish enclave around the base that ringed the base, and they all the carpet shops, all the uh, tchotchke stuff that, that Americans can't help but buy when they go overseas, right? And we actually were the local economy. We were it. And then the, because of other local uh, dynamics, they got pushed out and Syrian refugees got pushed in and they were um, conducting things against the base. It got to be very complicated. In other areas, it's funny, I have a lot of time in Korea. A lot of time in Korea and I love Korea. But there was a time that we had about 30 bases in Korea. And around those bases, those were the, economic, the economically thriving areas of South Korea. Now you go to Korea, you know, I, and I just got there, my first tour there was 2010, and I was like, wow, oh, it's a great modern place. People had been stationed here 20 years before they, that came back said, oh yeah, none of this was here. These were rice fields, benjo ditches, and you know, it was, it was horrible. And now, I mean, that one generation, Korea became this thriving, incredibly modern, um, economic powerhouse, right? So we used to, they used to love having all those bases. Now we collapsed to about four because the Korean economy exploded. They needed the land to continue their growth. So in places that, are, that need the economic influence of having American presence, extremely popular, very positive. The tensions start when things start to recover nicely. It happened in Germany too. We used to have dozens of bases in Germany when it was West Germany, right? But now we've consolidated somewhat. But, um, Positive relations with the local civilian population is one of the most important things you do as an overseas military member. And that was uh, something we managed very, very aggressively. Who's next? Ah, we've already got you the microphone. Before you uh, say your question, Tom, remind me, uh, when do we have to close? Okay, so we've got plenty of time, so over to you. Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming in and speaking. This has been awesome so far. Um, Going back to your point on kind of barriers to entry into the military based on health, it was really surprising, but understanding how, like, you know, there's, like, a 40th, 50th percentile of people our age are barred from entering the military due to, like, ADHD pres prescriptions, other health issues. I was wondering, from their perspective, uh, from your perspective, how do, like, what, what is the main concern with, like, what was the main reasoning behind not allowing people like that to enter into this field? Is it because like there's risk that they might cause issues or is it more that the military lacks resources or is there another concern? And then also moving on from that, like 
what are some strategies to kind of lower this barrier of entry? Mm. That's a great question. So the reasoning uh, behind the barrier to service from, and we'll just say the ADHD, the uh, uh, um, other anti-anxiety, antidepressant medication, the reasons that I've heard is the, uh, the risk of self-harm for the individuals, um, especially if they can't access the medication. So everyone has to be deployable in the military, right? So you have to be able to go overseas um, in, in various positions it lower a higher um, likelihood that'll happen. Some have zero likelihood that that would happen. But there's even a system in the military where if you have a family member, so you have a child who has special needs, it's called the EFMP program, the Exceptional Family Member Program. So my stepdaughter, from my now ex-wife's first marriage, which gets very common, I can't believe I just said that, but she had some significant medical issues. So we couldn't go to certain places around the world because they didn't have the medical service um, available for them, right? So I think the concern is will the services be available for them and will the person be a risk to themselves or others because of the medical history? Now there are, I see the rules changing where if you're off the medication for one year and you get medical uh, authority to say that you're operating at the, at the mental and, and physical capacity that you should to serve, that you can get the waivers to now come in. But move this one step further, marijuana use. Still, and it is now, you talk about yeah, you know, I'm gonna talk about this in a second. You know what the biggest thing, the biggest drama right now? Because tattoos were like, you know, like, there's a lot of tattoos now. And we said you can't have them past a certain part, they have to be covered by a sleeve, can't have them in your hands, can't get in your neck. But personal tattoos now are a really big thing, right? So that has been um, allowed now, and that was a great pressure relief. But the next, the big thing is beards. Because mm. <laughs> I'm serving in Turkey and I'm commanding these uh, various NATO forces and the Dutch left and they were like recruiting poster ultimate soldier individuals, men and women. The Dutch were unbelievable military professionals and they were being replaced by the Spanish who were, had beards and they all had mismatch uniforms, <laughs> you know, and they were much more informal. North, North European, Southern European contrast. It was very interesting, but they were both equally good at their job. So... You know, do we really want to keep telling people you can't grow a beard and be in the military? Well, maybe we just let them grow a beard, right? If this thing leads you into everything else. Like, so in, in your world, you probably grew the beards when you deployed. And I could grow a mean beard in like six days, by the way, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> so there are ways that we have to be more adaptive to the emerging norms. Recreational marijuana use is a thing. It's never been more available than it is right now, between the gummies and the vaping and everything else. So amongst everything else, it's something else that, that, that has to be looked at. I'm out of the decision tree for all these things now. I could influence them before. I was involved in the debate on transgender policy. That was fascinating. But different um, conversation, but similar enough. It's, it's something that has to be looked at to address the realities, right? But it is a concern over uh, self-harm and availability uh, of medication to stay in a normalized state where you won't be a threat to yourself or others. Does that make sense? Can you just say something about how that works on the other side? So you, you've enlisted, uh, taken your commission, you're serving, and then you suffer from anxiety and depression. I presume they're not asking you to leave the service over that. That's um, correct. So how does that work? Yeah, that includes other diagnoses. Like it used to be, and I had, you know, the worst part for me was always wearing chemical gear and wearing a gas mask. I used to, that was the one thing. Every time I was a gas mask down, I'm like, I'm getting out. I'm not doing this anymore. I can't stand this, right? There, were, there was a kind of a wave in the military of uh, asthma. And then people that were getting diagnosed with asthma were being kicked out. And if they were at the 12, 13 year mark of the old retirement system, you weren't necessarily gonna get any kind of access to retirement or any kind of transition care. Sometimes you got medical retirement, there was a proportion of your pay, but sometimes not. And that now I believe if you're diagnosed with asthma after you're in, then you can stay on service. Same thing with eczema and other things because of the reasons we just said. Anxiety and depression, you go into mental health counseling, that's been robusted, and uh, you'll be non-deployable, you won't be able to access weapons typically until you come off of them. But there's places that people can work and be very effective, you know? I'm just thinking about, uh, you have not, all billets are supposed to be deployable, so you have an individual organization, they're all deployable, but you have these areas that would not deploy, and you could put people in there that had an emerging medical need, or even a pregnancy, or normal life circumstances, and until that was 
won't say resolved, but you know, you have your child, you have your family medical leave, and then you're able to deploy again when you have your care plan put in. So yeah, once you're in, this is funny, you talked about the VA before. Once you're in, something goes wrong, the, the government has bought your problem. You know, one of Mark Jr.'s, uh, my son's uh, best friends at the Air Force Academy had a double hip replacement from hockey. And I, they commissioned him. I couldn't believe it, because now the military owns his health forever. Will he need another hip replacement? Absolutely, yes. And it's going to be very expensive. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's part of the system. Medical costs in the military is, is it's a budget breaker. You know? So that's why they're probably so like, ultra um, concerned. They've invested a lot in, in these guys, too, though. So it, I think it makes sense, right? You don't want to cut them loose because uh, they got a hip replacement. Uh, question back here. Who has the mic? Oh, yeah, there you go. Big red one. <laughs> I served in Vietnam and was one of the early deployments. Uh, when I came home in 1966, um, we went into San Francisco. I had always heard about Fisherman's Wharf, and uh, two other officers and I went there for dinner, and we only had uniforms. The civilian clothes hadn't come back yet. We were spit upon uh, as returning Vietnam vets. To piggyback on the experience Turkey, uh, Okinawa. Um, what is the military doing to sell itself to the civilian population in our country? Obviously, somebody missed something back in 1966. But are we making an effort now to make the military acceptable and desirable? Yeah, well. Um, and I, it always breaks my heart to hear stories like yours, but it, we have a lot of alumni from Norwich who went um, early in Vietnam, and I, I hear their stories a lot too, so it, it, always, it always saddens me, right? So I feel like, and this is a, it's a very interesting question, and really the tides turned on this in the really mid to late 80s. The military made a conservative effort to expand the brand and show that this is a value-added enterprise for our country, right, the all-volunteer Force, and it really had to do with the aging in and out of the Vietnam era and, and those that learned the lessons and wanted to fix it. Colin Powell might have been one of the most effective talents that changed the image. And there's this beautiful thing that I give lectures on all the time called the trust index. Right? So the trust index shows the most trusted, all around the least trusted um, areas of, of uh, American society. And the military is always in the top three, always. It's always, uh, it's, uh, military nurses are usually number one, love nurses, right? Um, sometimes medical, but they're up and down. What's fascinating about that is the top, so it's usually military, first responders, and, um, and medical, uh, nurses specifically. The bottom three, we probably know what they are, lawyers, journalists, and politicians. So the great irony in it all is when the top three misstep, the bottom three get into the chili and they start making things much, much worse to break that trust, right? So the military has been hyper-cautious, I believe, since the late 80s to protect that trust, the, the, um, the institutional trust. And we talked about volunteer force versus draft force. Part of the volunteer force, I think, is part of that, right? I mean, you, were, you led a draft force organization that, that must, I cannot imagine the complexities of that. So I, I would. Half? Yeah. There's a question in there that I don't know how to answer. Should we go back to a draft force? I would say no, and I would, <laughs> I would um, if I ever had that question that I have to answer it more formally, I would pull the Vietnam era leadership to ask what was your experience with draft, um, with the draft organization. But I think it's just maintaining the trust, being aggressive with the marketing, and when there is a misstep, to handle it aggressively and not to tolerate aberrant unethical behavior. When Abu Ghraib happened, I was in Iraq and I was on the way rotating out and I had to go back in in the aftermath. But uh, you know, no one hated that more than people in the uniform because they felt they felt a betrayal of trust and the professional standard. And we knew it was invited. It was inviting scrutiny in a way that we would not be able to survive if we didn't handle it perfectly. So every misstep now is handled, um, I think, aggressively and transparently, and then with very low toleration for aberrant behavior. Senator. 
What about you guys? What's been your experience um, when you came back from uh, serving with uh, interactions with the civilian population? What do they understand, misunderstand? Um, you know, sometimes I think um, the, uh, the needle has flipped back so far to the other side that there's a kind of knee-jerk deference to uh, the military on, on many matters where I think it's right for civilians to be able to express uh, an opinion. So we're trying to find the right uh, balance between these two things, our democracy's precedent, uh, you know, uh, uh, based on the idea uh, that there's civilian control, but we need that military expertise and we need to encourage and respect service. So what are you guys seeing um, on that? Um, well, since coming back from, you know, my deployment and getting out of the military, um, my entire life has been at Dartmouth pretty much. Um, the one thing I found is the students have been extremely welcoming. I was a little nervous, you know, um, and I think we can, we talked about the military's, you know, hyper focus on civilian relations to maintain those like this uh, civil military connection. Um, and I think that starts at the small units. Really, we were talking, we were talking about, you know, punishing like absurd behavior and, um, you know, as a small unit leader in charge of, you know, 12, 15 Marines, I'm making sure that they're, you know, not getting in trouble on the weekends and, you know, going out there and being good citizens, we were constantly uh, reinforced that um, you're always going to be judged as a Marine if you, you know, commit a crime 20 years down the road. You're, the headlines would say, you know, Marine veteran Ryan Irving committed a crime, whatever, uh, you know. What, you're always going to be judged on that. And I think that um, that constant reinforcement and this encouragement to be the best citizen you can be has kind of uh, led to this um, change in the way that civilians have viewed um, veterans. And um, I think the, it changed so much that even, you know, not one person has questioned really uh, like my service in Afghanistan in a negative way. They've all been very supportive. And even if they disagreed with that, you know, with the you know, deployment or what we did in Afghanistan, I've had, you know, overwhelmingly positive experiences. And maybe that's because I'm at Dartmouth and it's a small school. And if somebody gave me a negative experience, I'd probably see him again. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it, it's... Uh, it's, it's, I think it's encouraging, and um, I think that might also be, um, you know, you were talking about holding them accountable, um, the military accountable. There might be a fear of that um, because, you know, um, they support you so much and they support small unit leaders. And um, I think that, you know, although, like, I'm very for supporting military and veterans, I think um, accountability is still important from the civilian side. And I mentioned this earlier, but the civil control of the military is, you know, one of the most important values we have in this country. Um, and being afraid to question the military because you're going to be called on patriotic by some, you know, demagogue force, I don't think that's, uh, you know, a good step. But I do appreciate, you know, all the students here that have, you know, made me feel at home since I've come back. I don't know if you've had similar experiences. Definitely. Everything has been extremely positive um, since I've come back. And I don't know to what extent that is that people don't know what I did overseas. I think Jason Mosel um, has a great talk about what he, when he talks about the word or the phrase, thank you for your service, he really harps on uh, the growing disconnect of people not knowing what they're thanking them for. And that's definitely his story to tell. Um, but when I think about the civilian military relationship, the first one I, the first thing I think about is when we're in, when we're stateside and we're off base, we still represent the service community. And Ranger Regiment was very particular about how we interacted with anyone in our surroundings. There was zero tolerance for causing any sort of kerfuffle. A single DUI, you're out. Any negative interaction with law enforcement, you're out. You are fired from the organization because we hold ourselves at a high level. And I think that trickles down and is embodied in the entire military. There are repercussions for having negative interactions between the military and the surrounding civilian populace. The second thing was that degrades military credibility is civilian casualties overseas. I was fortunate that over my entire 11 months that I was deployed to Afghanistan over two rotations, um, there were countless night operations, raids, airstrikes, um, and high MAR strikes. <laughs> And through my entire deployment, my task force was responsible for zero civilian casualties. I was made aware of the civilian casualty protocol, and the first person to be if there was a CIVCAS incident, it had to go to a two-star general. That's the level of responsibility that the military took 
to make sure that we were protecting Afghan civilians and only targeting the bad guys. So I really think that face-to-face -face interaction on the state side is the most important thing to keeping military credibility backed up with um, ethical conduct overseas. That's great. Uh, our next question here. I was just curious about uh, the kind of perception of the politicization of the military and the effects on recruiting. So I know, like on the left, you'll hear some people thinking like the budget only goes towards defense contractors, and on the right, people will kind of deride it as being woke and stuff like that. Um, so kind of how do those attacks affect uh, the ability of the military to complete its mission, but also the ability to recruit people from both of those sides since both constituencies are on the attack? Yeah. It's interesting, and it's a it is a trap, right? And it's it's the polarization of our country. I mean, half the half the country thinks you should do one thing, and the other half, if you do that thing, not only are you wrong, you're a terrible person, right? And being a, if you're anybody in this room thinks you want to be a university president, you don't, because <laughs> it happens to me at a smaller scale. But you know, there's the argument, and take the politics out of it. What's the military's purpose? It's fighting when your nation's wars, right? Yeah, it's all about lethality, operational effectiveness. So the conversation has to be. Does that kind of training or conversation make you a more lethal and effective force? And if you're, you know, I remember, in ok I mean, Okinawa had a horrible string of, uh, of activities with the Marines that were stationed there and that really hurt the brand of the United States military. And then they had some leadership changes. They had some high accountability of moments and they recovered, mostly they recovered the reputation. But it took some re training to say, this is how you interact. This is how you have a responsible relationship. You know, and you got to remember, right? So this is a unique population in this room. It's a Dartmouth University and its friends, and this is uh, you're you're very intelligent, and you I'm sure you've been uh, raised responsibly by family. But the military is a microcosm of our society. I never forget basic training. My first day, it was an eight man day, eight of us, right? There was a guy named Bonton from Louisiana. That was his whole name. He could not read. He was a Cajun, and literally couldn't read. A literal white supremacist from Michigan who never saw a black person in his life, right? I'm, I was from New Jersey, so, you know. Diversity to me is just called being from New Jersey because everyone from everywhere is lives in New Jersey, right? But you had this group of people that all of a sudden has to, that's why basic training is the deconstruction and then reconstruction experience it is because of the wide backgrounds. So when people push back on some of the training that happens in basic training or on active duty, I try to remind them, hey, you're not talking about people that are like you or think like you. You're talking about a national sample that we have to bring to some common understanding about what it means to be a member of society and a member of a team. So it's going to continue to be challenging. There's no question. Um, and General Milley, uh, you know, he he has been at the front of all this and he's taken a pretty severe beating. But General Mattis, I think, has a very similar uh, viewpoint on it. We have to understand all the viewpoints to be more effective leaders that makes us more lethal. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It gets back to something you said earlier that the military still, in spite of all these efforts to pull it into politics, that remains among the most trusted institutions in the United States. And I think it's, it's partly that that causes both sides, or however many sides you want to say there are, of the debate to try to grab onto the military and, and get its uh, endorsement. Right, because uh, everybody uh, supports the military, and so if the military is on my side, then you should support me uh, too. And I think uh, the military's been right to resist that because, of course, the moment that uh, does take a side uh, clearly in some of these um, intensely political debates, there are some things where, it, of course, does have to uh, stand up, and I think has done a pretty good job of that mostly. But the moment it is seen to be a political force, that's when it's not going to be at the top of that list of trusted institutions anymore. And I think that's probably not going to be good for the military, and it's not going to be good for our country either. Uh, the guy from the corner in the green shirt has been trying to get in for a while. <laughs> Marco. Yeah, but we've got, the, we've got one question, then we'll get to Marco. Well, I'd like to sneak in two questions if oh. I can. Uh, first of all, we had a brief conversation with the President of Rome before we started the, the discussion. You suggest you may have a quick little story about uh, a couple of World War II veterans that influenced your life. and. Uh, after you respond to that, I'd like to ask you one more quick question. Sure, and I did. Uh, we had a quick conversation watching the clock. I'll be super brief, and I'll encourage everyone to remember these two names, and you can research them on your own and watch their YouTube presentations. 
because I thought, I always think today is the day I got it all figured out, and I meet somebody who real, makes me realize I do not, right? The first was a guy named Jerry Yellen, Y-E-L-L-I-N. He has an incredible story. He was a World War II aviator in the Pacific Theater who hated the Japanese, and he has an incredibly sad story that I'd love to tell you, but I don't want to take the, too much time, but he wound up um, in a very dark place for most of his life. And I met him in passing. I didn't think he was going to teach me anything. And it really went into a tailspin when his son um, uh, proposed to a Japanese woman. And the condition of their marriage was that they had to live in Japan. And then how this affected Yellen. And then bringing together those families. And it actually, that was his healing process that saved his life. It's a very beautiful story. Uh, I'd recommend you, if you have time, to look it up. And the other is a gentleman named uh, Enoch Woody Woodhouse. He's a Tuskegee Airman. And uh, he's had a lot of time in Norwich. And I was just with him in Chicago uh, last weekend where he was a speaker at an event. He has done more to make me understand race relations in the United States than any other human being. And what he says about the real challenges he had as a Tuskegee Airman and that the country we live in now is something of which he has tremendous pride. And uh, he... He's never been in a room where he didn't influence everyone in a highly positive way. So Woody Woodhouse uh, is the other. So I'd recommend those two for your personal research. Okay, my question uh, for you is, uh, do you think there's a link between patriotism and military service, and, and what might that be? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, most people, I think, in the military are patriotic at some level. But I, I think it's a... Uh, What's the statistical term? It's um, correlation. It's really, it, yeah, there's correlation, but not causation, right? Thank you. I've been out of the classroom for a while. <laughs> so I think most people in the military typically are very patriotic, but you can be very patriotic and not be in the military, I, I think is the neatest way to say it. And, you know, I, some of the most patriotic people I've ever met in my life didn't serve in uniform. That's, that's okay. But I think generally people in the military do believe in the personalization <coughs> of our country and our, and our nat international identity. Real quick aside, because the other name I'm going to give you, um, she's a countess, and I just met her in Chicago for the first time. She runs the Normandy Institute, which is the place that perpetuates the memory of the Americans who lost their lives in, uh, in D-Day. And she's very heavily involved in the paratrooper community. Um, Dorothea is her, is her first name. Fascinating person, but she and I were having dinner, dinner in Chicago. And she said, she and other Europeans are very worried about what the United States is becoming, because for her, we've been a beacon of hope and a standard to aspire to since World War II. And you can feel Europeans looking at us with a decreasing level of admiration. And she's very worried. As a, she's Dutch, but she uh, married a Frenchman, and now she runs the Institute. So very, um, very interesting perspective to hear from a European. Got our last uh, question from Marco, and uh, then we'll wrap up. Hello? <laughs> I'm going to just talk. Um, <laughs> I guess I kind of want to go back to this conversation we were having earlier about, um, you know, civilian respect for the military. And I, I think my question kind of gets at encouraging people to pursue public service writ large. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm being given back the microphone. Um, and I guess for me, I'm a, I'm a senior, I'm a government major, um, really interested in working for the government. In some capacity in public service. Um, when I tell my peers about that, I met with a lot of skepticism and a lot of like, why would you want to do that? I think there's a lot of reasons for that, right? I think, you know, part of it's the pay gap, like you were talking about. Part of it's restrictions on your day-to-day -day life or, you know, judgment for mental health, marijuana use, whatever it may be. But I think... One of the larger issues that comes up a lot of times is, um, you know, questions people have around recent acts that the U.S. government's undertaken, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people see things like Abu Ghraib or, you know, um, Guantanamo, our conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, whatever it may be, and say, you know, I think I can respect people who, you know, uh, honored the call to duty and, and work there, but I don't know if I want to be a part of an organization that facilitated that, right? And I think that's true for military service, I think that's true for public service. That's a concern a lot of people have. And I guess I'm wondering, how do we resell public service to the American public writ large in the face of these mistakes and missteps we've done in the past? 
Um, how do we kind of reclaim that as something that you know people striking to make a positive impact um, should do? Well, if you want to get into government service, maybe you're the guy that can go and solve that for them. Because <laughs> I'll tell you right now, they're not doing too, too well. If you watch the new recruiting commercials, it's very interesting because they're actually leveraging parental support. And there's a very interesting thing happening right now with the, um, with the proclivity for service. If a young person wants to go into the military right now or government service, the parents discourage it. Grandparents and high school counselors encourage it. But parents, so the one generation above the person who's interested, is actually discouraging service. So the entire marketing campaign now, you see a young person in high school, and they're talking to the parent about, I think I want to do this, and they're in a the military setting, and then it kind of flashes, and they're actually sitting in their kitchen table having a conversation, and they basically say, will you support me? And the parent says, well, geez, maybe I should, right? So that's the, the, that's the thing, because it, it has been appealing but it's lost some of the luster, the unpopular wars, right? Um, uh, the PT, everything we've already talked about. It has to be restored as a, as a suitable option. Since I was such a knucklehead, my dad couldn't sign the papers fast enough because I was under 18. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I was, I, what, how I came in doesn't happen anymore. It's not allowed. It's illegal. Um, <laughs> probably not everyone had a good experience, I guess. So I, I would just say that is the million dollar question. It is the great question to probably end on watching yeah. the clock because that's how to get things back on track. It's to, Reincentivize and to re-advertise why it's appealing and why it's important to the national character. Really is a great uh, way to wrap up. Uh, and again, thinking ahead to tomorrow and Veterans Day to think about um, whatever way you might take to serve others. Um, and if there are students here um, watching and thinking about that, I hope you'll come and see us at the Dickey Center um, where we try really hard to um, make uh, those paths into service uh, more possible of all different types. And there's other places here on, uh, on campus where you can think about that too. And even if it's not through your uh, career or academic uh, life, if there's some way uh, you can be of service, I think that's uh, something that would be an excellent way to honor uh, veterans on, on Veterans Day. And so uh, to these gentlemen here, I just want to thank you for uh, your time here with us today. Thank you for your example. And I really do want to thank you for your service and happy Veterans Day. <laughs>